My name is Donna, and I confess that I am a saver. I like to save stuff. Anyone else out there a saver? Yeah, there's usually one in every family. Good. I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> My basement is filled with lots of boxes, filled with stuff. I even have my college notebooks. Now, they're only 25 years old, but you never know when you might need them, right? Thankfully, my husband is not a saver. <laughs> he is a sharer and a disposer. He continually fills bags with things to recycle, to go to trash, or to go to Goodwill. And, unlike me, he loves to have yard sales. So he can, you know, lighten our load and make someone else's day. One man's trash is another man's treasure, so they say. But for me, I like to pack it away in a box and save it for a rainy day. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. And Transfiguration is from the story that Matt read uh, from the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus goes up on a high mountain to pray. And while he's there, he's transfigured. His face changes. His clothes become dazzling white. He is filled with the glory of God. And the disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, can see this, and they are overwhelmed. They are so excited and amazed at this brilliant light that they want to preserve it. And so they begin to talk about building a booth that they can put Jesus in and stay on that mountain and bathe in this glorious light forever. They want to pack away their Jesus experience in a box and save it for a rainy day. But then they, all of a sudden they hear a voice, God's voice from the clouds, saying, this is my son. Listen to him. Well, Jesus' actions spoke louder than words. He led the disciples off the mountain, down the mountain, and back into the world because they had work to do. There were needs to be met. There were people to be helped and healed. The first one they come across is a young boy. He's possessed by a demon, and all is not right with his body and his mind. And so the father of the boy says to Jesus, Please heal my son, for the disciples weren't able to do it. Well, Jesus called the boy over, and he used his healing powers, and he healed the boy. And everyone was amazed at the greatness of God. But he said to his disciples, You faithless generation, how much longer do I have to put up with you? Why was he so mad at his disciples? I think it's because they did not share their faith with one in need or their powers to heal that Jesus had given to them. Even at the bottom of the mountain, I can see them, can you, still coming up with their plans of how to construct this little box they can put Jesus in to preserve his glory, to hold on to what is good, to contain their religion, to save it for a rainy day. Jesus entrusted to his disciples then and now a word of hope, a gift of grace, a healing touch, and eternal love. And what have we done? We have built churches to put Jesus in, to preserve his glory, to hold on to what is good, to hold on to what is good, and to keep it for ourselves. We have put Jesus into a box to save for a rainy day. Well, friends, it is raining. Today is a rainy day. People and the world are in need of a word of hope. They are in need of a gift of grace, a healing touch. People are in need of love, and they are not flocking to the church to find what they need. 
Transfiguration is about change. Not just change of Jesus with his face changing and his clothes changing. It's about a call for us to change the way we live as his disciples. Now, I know that change is not our favorite word. Nobody much likes change. We sort of like things the way that they are. We like to keep them the same. And it's even better if we can kind of keep things all organized in nice little boxes where we know where they are. Are you a saver of your faith? Do you like to come on Sundays and have a glorious worship experience and then for the rest of the week, mum's the word? We sort of like to have an experience on Sunday, but then keep our church very separate from the rest of our lives, right? Transfiguration Day calls us to change, change the way we live and change the way we share our faith. So how do we share our faith anyway? Well, it's hard. We're Presbyterians, that's one thing. We grow up not knowing how to share our faith. And so for the next couple months, we're going to talk about this. And we're going to actually have a couple sessions where we learn how to write our story, write it out. What's important to us? What do we believe? What do we love about our church? Why do we want people to come? And every story is going to be a little different depending on who you are and how you've lived and what your life's been like. But we're going to write it out. And then we're going to practice it. We're going to practice speaking it to people that we know and love that are comfortable with us to get us ready to be able to be out in the world. And if we meet someone, we'll feel comfortable telling our story. It won't be scary for us. Because if we love our church and we think it's important for people to know the good news of Jesus, then we'll find our voice and share it. We're also going to have a class on spiritual gifts discernment. So we can learn what are we particularly good at and how can we use those gifts to serve the church and serve the world. St. Francis said, Preach the gospel always. If necessary, use words. Sometimes we'll share our faith using words. And other times we'll share our faith in other ways like smiling at a stranger, offering a hug to an enemy, offering a healing touch to one who is ill, offering a prayer to one who is hurting, offering a meal to one who is hungry. How do you share your faith? Well, like I said, it is raining today, not actually raining. It's a beautiful sunny day, but the churches are closing. But in the midst of the rain, God is doing a new thing. In the Presbyterian Church USA, a transfiguration is at work with a new way to do church and to share faith. It's called 1001 Worshiping Communities, and you can look it up online. It's amazing. They've got all these videos of these different organizations. And what it is, is it's a, it's, it's a way to do church differently, to meet people where they are in the community and have church in a different way today so that the word of God will continue to be shared. One of them I want to tell you about. It's called Isaiah's Table. There was an old church in Syracuse, New York, that closed its doors, didn't have enough people to keep it open anymore. And so some of those members and some neighbors got together, and they began having Bible study and prayer. And out of several years of this, a vision came to them. They realized that how they felt closest to God was when they, no surprise, when they gathered together at table and ate. And they realized that there were several people in their town that would never come into the church for a traditional worship service. So they decided to start having breakfast on Saturday mornings and have worship as part of that. And they have 
Presbyterians and other people of faith, and they also have lots of folks who are just looking for a community, a place where someone might know them by name. One man said, Isaiah's table is great. They accept me for who I am right off the streets. I just love it here. In addition to having breakfast, Isaiah's table also has started a food pantry, a community food garden, as well as a fresh produce uh, sharing so that they can meet their neighbors' needs in different ways. One woman who attends, came off the streets and attends Isaiah's table said, this place reminds me of the love of Christ. For in this place, I feel the love of Christ through the people here. I just love them. Isaiah's table is God doing something new. Grace, hope, and food for all. Friends, Jesus was born to feed, to heal, to teach, to share, to shine, to change lives. So let Jesus out of the box, your own personal box and out of the church's box. Open your mouths, open your hearts, open your hands, and share your faith. Let Christ's love and light shine through you. And watch as together we change the world for good, one person at a time. Thanks be to God.